Fridays, this guy comes in, he writes for the Marina Times, he does it all, movies, music, he comes and goes on a rainbow. The great Michael Snyder, everyone, the culture blaster. Hello, Michael. Uh, I've got a major announcement. Um, I am changing the name of this segment from Culture Blaster Legacy to, for God's sake, Mark, would you get to the segment already? <laughs> you, ha- you have been very patient, sir. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, um, it was uh, Leap Day yesterday, and yes, I sir. hope no one came down with leaprosy, uh, you know, in case you dropped out of oh, elementary God, really? school. Wow. Every four years is leap year. Uh, when we're given an extra day in February, the 29th. So, of course, I wasted it. And now uh, it's March, which means March Madness, which also means Mark's Madness. And, yeah, and it a- does. I'm afraid that Albert's going to ignore all my renowned audio drops when he sets up the field. So I'm going to have my own competition, Mike's Madness, uh, which will include <laughs> three of my favorite drops that Mark Thompson Show audience members can vote on. Number one, mm. it's another classic Mark Thompson time waster. That is okay. a good one. Yep. yep. Number two. I suggest you ease up on the edibles, Mark. That's number two. <laughs> I don't remember that one. Okay, and number, good. Number three it happens every couple of weeks. Thanks for paying attention, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> this well, is a classic to... Mark Thompson time waster. Yeah, there you go. There's that anyway, one. Anyway, right? uh, yeah. before we get to the uh, movie reviews, I want to point out some uh, nightlife action here in San Francisco this weekend. I, I, I'm in San Francisco at the moment. I will be coming back as the coastal commuter to Los Angeles in a couple of days. But uh, this Saturday night, Music City, San Francisco, uh, a club and a complex with uh, recording studios and uh, the San Francisco Music Hall of Fame. Uh, they're having a, a, a an ongoing soft opening with a fundraiser Saturday night starting at 5 p.m. with Sponge Bath as the opening band. And at 7 p.m., the unauthorized Rolling Stones with um, Music City founder uh, Rudy Colombini singing lead, doing the, uh, you know, the Mick Jagger stuff. There's drinks and food. And, um, you know, I'm pretty excited about this place. It's, it's you know, trying to bring uh, the culture back to San Francisco, fostering a place for artists to gather and create, which, you know, has been a problem uh, in the wake of the, uh, you know, the dot com booms and and the tech booms that have hit the city and and prices going up. I'm really, really grateful for Rudy and this project. So, yay. That's great. Yeah, I know you're right. I mean, there's a lot of great in the city and it's good to, you know, get it some oxygen. Good for you. Anyway, um, I'm also going to hit Madonna Apocalypse. Madonna Apocalypse is booty at the Cat Club on Folsom between 8th and 7th Saturday night. I am not stopping, Mark. And speaking of not stopping, should we well, get people some should look for reviews? you down there? The people who love Michael Snyder, many love the Culture Blaster. You'll be down there Saturday night. I will be both at Music City and also at uh, Booty at the Cat Club. Um, All right. It's movie time, and uh, we got a big old blockbuster kicking things off. Uh, I caught an advanced screening of Dune Part 2, and anyone on social media who follows me will know that uh, I can't wait for the other two movies in the series, How You Dune and What You Dune. I can't wait. Oh, my God. I can't believe it. Uh, You know, I I have... I have heard uh, this is a huge, huge, the first Dune, what did you think of the first Dune? Remind us. I thought it was a setup and I thought it was beautifully done, but you get to the end point of the first part and you're like, I want more. And guess what? Dune part two gives you the more you wanted. It completes uh, director, co-screenwriter Denis uh, uh, Villeneuve's adaptation of author Frank Herbert's watershed sci-fi novel, Dune, and it is a triumph. I mean, even more so than part one, this is visually stunning, well-acted, mega exciting, faithfully bringing Herbert's tale of uh, interstellar political intrigue and ecological harmony uh, and uh, the plight of indigenous peoples to the screen. This this is a little deeper than, you know, just a shoot 'em up, you know, the wow. ray guns uh, to the fore. And if you haven't seen part one or read the book, which was the first of a series, I will try to be as spoiler free as possible here. I will say that young Paul Atreides, 
played by Timothy Chalamet, has found himself on the desert planet of Arrakis, or Arrakis after surviving an attack on his aristocratic family by the evil Harkonnens, another family, all of which uh, are vying to control uh, Arrakis, where giant sandworms produce a substance called spice. And this is the most valuable substance in this particular corner of the galaxy. And the phrase is, he who controls the spice will control the universe or something to that extent. Uh, anyway, uh, dealing with the uh, Harkonnens who are attempting to take over uh, Arrakis in the name of the emperor, um, now, young Paul is stuck with the Freeman, a nomadic desert tribe uh, that actually lives and thrives uh, on this dune planet, which is, again, mostly desert. And in the process, uh, Paul uh, falls for uh, Shani, played by uh, Zendaya, and their relationship is partially uh, at the heart of this movie. But you also get, uh, again, magnificent battles, political intrigue. Uh, as it happens, uh, the Harkonnens, who are led uh, by uh, a gross creature played by the great Stellan Skarsgård, they have their own uh, equivalent to Paul, who is going to inherit uh, the Harkonnens' uh, family power. And he's played by Austin Butler. And you know that uh, Austin Butler's character is going to come up against uh, Timothy Chalamet's character, and it's going to be Elvis versus Wonka. You know this is going to happen as you're watching the movie. <laughs> and, man, it, it's there's a, some great stuff in this movie. Uh, Javier Bardem plays a Freeman leader. Uh, Rebecca Ferguson is Paul's mother, who is uh, one of the uh, Ben Jesseret, who are kind of psychic uh, women uh, who have their order, kind of like an order of nuns, but, um, you know, obviously um, Rebecca Ferguson's character has had a child, so uh, chastity isn't the issue, at least initially. Uh, it is some potent stuff. Um, Josh Brolin is back as a an Atreides uh, ally. Um, it's uh, Florence Pugh shows up as the daughter of the Emperor. Dave Batista is a Harkonnen, and the Emperor is played by and this is new to part two. You're not going to believe this. Christopher Walken. I am wow. the emperor. Wow. What? Everybody brings their A game. Was uh, I, was, I, I was blown away by Dune part two. And again, it's really important that you watch it after having seen part one and taken as a whole. Again, I found it to be a triumph. Well, I, it's fantastic. I have to uh, tell you that, as I recall, I don't remember really what state I was in. I think I saw it in the theater. I think I was clear headed. Dune one. It's a little complicated, isn't it, Michael? I mean, will you grant me that it's a complicated plot or was I just not in the right state of mind? Well, the warring families and the political intrigue that involves trying to control uh, Arrakis and the spice trade is at the heart of this. But again, like I say, um, Herbert, when he wrote Dune, also had uh, ecological um, preservation in mind, respect for, you know, tribal life, uh, the people that live on the planet. And, you know, uh, it's got a religious I, I, tone to it as well. Yeah. I, the only last thing I'll say we'll move on is that uh, I, re I read the first Dune and it it was complicated, man. I remember there's a there's a glossary with it. There's it was a real it was a heavy read. Well, if if worms freak you out, you don't want to see Dune. I'll tell you that <laughs> giant worms. Um, and by the way, uh, one of the uh, plot elements here is the idea that Paul, this outsider, may well be the Messiah for the Freeman people, and that may be a sham or it may be legit. All of this stuff plays out in part two. Uh, again, highly highly recommended. Let's move on to something a little lighter, may we? Yes, please. Uh, comedian and writer uh, Julio Torres, who was a veteran of SNL's writing staff and created the uh, twisted, dark and fitfully amusing HBO sitcom Los Espookies, has written and directed his very own starring vehicle, Problemista. And it's pretty original and surreal and funny. So Torres plays Alejandro, a wannabe toy designer from El Salvador, with a plan to move to New York City where he hopes to find success but he's e easily pushed around and exploited. And when his work visa expires before making any headway in the toy business, his only option 
to remain in the country is to agree to be the assistant to a lunatic artist played by the great Tilda Swinton. Um, Alejandro's escapades may be a little on the absurd side, as are the whimsical and uh, borderline cruel ministrations of Swinton's character. Uh, but the art world satire is on point, and the nightmarish convolutions that Alejandro faces as he tries to deal with the U.S. Department of Immigration are topical, uh, as well as uh, amusing. So culture commentary, social commentary, and laughs, uh, that's enough to earn my endorsement. By the way, Isabella Rossellini narrates the film, and you get supporting turns from RZA and the current award season darling Greta Lee from Past Lives. I enjoyed Problemista. It's in theaters. Uh, ministrations is a dang word. Uh, cool. Uh, and I'm sorry, who's the male lead? Who is that? Julio Torres, the guy who wrote and directed it. Wow. Former wow. SNL writer and uh, creator of Los Espookies, which is kind of cool and weird on HBO. Cool. Okay. Good. Uh, let's move on to something serious. Uh, based on harrowing true experiences, Shada is a moving drama about the lengths that Shada, a young Iranian mother, needs to go to to safeguard herself and her six-year-old daughter uh, while they live in an Australian woman's shelter. The problem is Shada's abusive husband, uh, a medical student and seemingly a Muslim fundamentalist, who immigrated to Australia with Shada and the kid and wants to drag them back to Iran when he completes his studies, like he's assaulted her in the past. And if Shada refuses to bow to his dictates, he intends to take the kid from her. Uh, first time filmmaker Noura uh, Niasari directed her own script and did a very good job. When you get to the end credits, there's archival footage, you know, home video to be precise, that illustrates the verity of the story, the truth. And uh, I thought this had moments of great compassion and great power, uh, beautiful performances by all concerned, great uh, work done by um, Zar Amir Ebrahimi, who plays Shada, and uh, the kid, um, it's a kid actor, and uh, she was also really good. Again, uh, this is a pretty potent drama, Shada. Wow. Uh, uh, Verity it's in is a ding word, yeah. It's in um, theaters. All right. Let me zip through one more film. Yeah, if and you I'll don't just mind. tell everybody we were a few minutes over. If you've got to go over to the, uh, if you want to continue live, I think Kim may have to go over to the after party live. Go ahead and do it. We're keeping Michael. We're gonna, you know, let this segment um, sit. I don't want it to be too rushed. So go ahead, Michael. Okay. Um, the film is called They Shot the Piano Player, and it's a colorful, fully animated, melody and rhythm charged feature film that serves as kind of an engaging documentary about a bossa nova piano master named Tenorio Junior, whose brief life was overshadowed by the stars of the Brazilian music genre, Antonio Carlos Jobim, Gilberto Gil, and others who dominated the movement in the 1960s and 70s. They all respected Tenorio, but we just don't hear about him. And his story is told in part through interviews with luminaries from the scene and associates of his within the framework yeah. mm -hmm. uh, within the framework of a fact-finding trip undertaken by a fictional New York jo uh, journalist who is voiced by Jeff Goldblum. And of course, he is a jazz pianist himself. This is directed by Fernando Truba and Javier Mariscal. And the movie includes a hefty selection of beautiful tracks uh, in the bossa nova genre as it recounts uh, the history uh, of the music's rise and international acclaim while also investigating the mystery uh, of Tenorio's disappearance. Uh, it is in theaters. Uh, they shot the piano player. Good stuff. Wow. Likes it. Got a lot of stuff today that you, that you liked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, quick uh, TV uh, recommendations, if you don't All mind. Right. Please. Uh, Constellation on Apple TV, starring Numi Rapace, the girl with the dragon tattoo, and also one of the stars of Alien Prometheus. Here she plays a Swedish astronaut on the International Space Station. Uh, when the crew experiences a crisis, putting into question whether she's going to be returned back to Earth uh, and reunite with her somewhat estranged husband, Magnus, played by James Darcy uh, from Agent Carter and Broadchurch, and their young daughter, Alice. Uh, the German star Barbara Sukawa is also in the cast as a director at the Russian Space Agency. There are mysteries afoot. I am caught up. 
Uh, the intrigue is powerful constellation. And uh, I know people want to hear about this Shogun on FX and Hulu. Uh, this miniseries adapts James Clavell's epic novel based on real events and actual people in Japan from the late 1500s into the early 1600s during the rise of Japan's crucial Edo period. It's been done once before, but so far this version is sumptuous and exciting. Uh, the most familiar face is Hiroyuki Sanada from Westworld, uh, Lost, and Helix in John Wick 4. He plays the politically astute Lord Yoshi Toranaga. Uh, also, Cosmo Jarvis plays English ship pilot uh, at, turned samurai John Blackthorne and Anna Sawai from Pachinko. And uh, the fast saga is the lovely Lady Mariko Shogun. Incredibly promising so far. Two episodes in and i am hooked <laughs> all right well what a list very impressive always to hear you enthusiastic about various things and i shall quickly review those things that michael has expressed enthusiasm for shogun the adaptation of the novel about real events he called it sumptuous which is a magnificent word i guess it reflects a real enthusiasm for this offering we also heard about constellation the Numira Pace, James Darcy offering. It is on Apple TV. Michael really liked that. Thought it moved along, and there's a uh, weirdness in space, I guess. Uh, and, and on and on Earth, if that is indeed Earth, uh, it's yeah, it's intriguing to say the least. How many episodes is that constellation? Um, I have four four in so far. There are more okay. to come. All right. Uh, they shot the piano player. The Bossa Nova history involving the disappearance of the great Bossa Nova player. He really likes it. It's an animated offering with Jeff Goldblum voicing a bunch of stuff. Michael really expressed enthusiasm for that, too. Yeah, real uh, interviews from real people, but, you know, the uh, it's an animated feature, so keep that in mind. Shada sounds like a gripping and powerful offering involving... An Australian woman shelter where they've gone to flee abuse from a husband or partner who is trying to drag them back to a Middle Eastern country for a life of subjugation and violence. And Shada got Michael's thumbs up also. Problemista is the Tilda Sweden, uh, Swinton Julio Torres. Uh, offering. It's funny. It's written and starring that guy, Julio Torres, that you see there. Michael liked Problemista also. And Dune Part 2 he began with. He highly recommends it. He says it's better than Dune 1. And he does suggest that you be familiar with Dune 1 before going into Part 2. But Do it got not eat... Yeah, just don't even think about watching part two unless you watch part one, which you can find online. I think it's streaming uh, and uh, absolutely uh, a better experience to see it in the theater, but uh, of necessity if you're going to watch the second part. Wow. He lavished praise on Dune part two, and it is a star-studded cast, and that cast includes Christopher Walken. As the emperor, a, as the yeah. emperor, I'm ruling here. I'm ruling. <laughs> He's fantastic. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to to seeing it. I've got to go back and watch part one again. And again, Michael Snyder in the city of San Francisco this weekend, knocking around at a couple of clubs. Where are you going to be again? I'm going to hit Music City, San Francisco uh, tomorrow night uh, for the uh, 6 p.m., 5 p.m. Uh, fundraiser to keep this thing expanding. Uh, it's a, a noble and worthy uh, landmark in uh, culture development in San Francisco. And then I'm hitting the Cat Club for Booty's Madonna Apocalypse. That's right. It's going to be mashups of madonna songs uh, i guess to honor her current um american her tour, tour yeah i hear it's really good the tour i've seen little clips it looks really good and the mashups are always good at uh at booty so look forward to that michael you've been patient lovely and thorough thank you he comes and goes on a rainbow the culture blaster michael snyder everybody Woo! i'm loving it